if a testicle collecting military contractor scientist unleashed a toxic gas over your town, mutating its inhabitants into daddy nurgles deranged children, what would you do? In this video, we'll follow a soul-seeking stripper and her bad boy ex-special forces ex-boyfriend. See if we can outmaneuver and outthink the zombie soldiers and ultimately attempt to beat the DC2 Project Terror in Grindhouse Planet Terror. Are you intelligent, brutal, and willing to unnecessarily sacrifice your fellow man for your own survival? Yes? Perfect! Well, I'm looking to expand the nerd team to assist me in ruthlessly adjudicating the decisions of our dear protags and antags for everyone's casual entertainment. And statistically, probably education for a few actual psychopathic preppers. If you're interested and can write above the fourth grade level, click the link in the description. All right, back to it. We start out following Cherry Darling, go-go dancing for married men on business trips until she awkwardly passes passes out on stage. Yes, that's what I'm opening this video with. Oh, and these two. Cherry can't take the stripper life anymore. That's why she's decided to quit with zero backup options. A leap of faith or as I like to call it, a leap of stupidity. While the walk of shaming on the shoulder of an unlit back road, back to what I can only surmise is a cheap trailer, she's nearly run over by the local redneck National Guard. Maybe don't stand in the road? There's some kind of deal going down at the defunct military base. Specimens that have escaped under the watchful eye of this poor fella. Unfortunately, this boss doesn't deal with excuses the old fashioned way. No, he wants the guy to clip off his own testicles to add to his collection. It's an impossible task. The male brain is hardwired to not snip your own nads off. At the snap of his fingers, all the future Unix goons immediately turn on him. I can get you I don't blame them. I'd have done the same thing. Oh, my boss is an idiot who let three horrific science experiments gone wrong escape? We're outnumbered, outgunned, and outpositioned. We have a few dudes with revolvers in their waistbands, blinded by staring into the headlights of multiple trucks full of men with automatic rifles. We would simply be gunned down. Plus, whatever got out sounds pretty f dangerous. I'd rather join forces with them. Maybe if I chop my ex-boss's nuts off quick enough, They'll even give me one of those gas masks. There's just one problem. Lieutenant Muldoon thinks the testes collector was holding out on him with more of that sweet, sweet DC2, a deadly biochemical agent. Abby's been around the block enough to know when it deals up. He gets the drop at the first shots. <laughs> Ugh, they got in your mouth. Muldoon's men secured the scene. Well, not really. The soldiers just lightly step on his elbows, leaving Abby's loaded pistol in his grasp. <laughs> Bro, what? Local cops have pinned Dude Tartar for buying cigarettes with Monopoly money. Not only did they leave the pistol in his hand, it was the hand pointing in the direction of the DC2 canisters. With Abby's own balls now in a vice, his only option is to unleash the biochemical gas and a hail of gunfire. His own traitorous men instantly begin melting horrifically, while Muldoon and his soldiers leave him to bask in the gas unaffected. So, by releasing the gas, you killed a few of your own dudes, doomed countless innocent lives, and wasted precisely zero ops. You getting away was merely because Muldoon let him flee in one of their Humvees for some dumb reason that I'm sure will bite him in the ass. Later, a clear violation of a nerd rule. Never let your enemies live. Have mercy. God has mercy. I don't. In the town downwind of the chemical plant explosion cover-up story, Dr. William Block is arriving at his hospital to treat some patients. Before he makes it three paces into the building, he's confronted by patient zero. God Bro, let me put on my scrubs first, will ya? Patient Zero says he was bit, but doesn't want to say by what, because the doc wouldn't believe him. Right. Yet yeah, the doctor's gonna need to know what caused this wound to know how to properly treat it. It would behoove you to tell him seeing as how pustules are already forming around it. As bad as this looks, life has a habit of showing you that it can always get worse. How'd you treat it? God. 
bro. The other doc is putting on a whole slideshow presentation for why, despite your problems, you should feel lucky to be in at least relatively good health, which homie here is not. His temp is 105, and his tongue is swollen with abscesses, which Dr. Block so kindly squishes until they pop on his face. I'm no doctor, but I'm gonna go ahead and say that the procedure should require level C PPE. Block radios for the nurse to bring in needles, which I hope are for a lethal injection because this dude's on a crash heading for a mercy kill. The nurse, who is Dr. William Block's supposedly unfaithful anesthesiologist wife named Dakota, straps the needle filled with God knows what into her garter belt, which seems quite unsafe. I certainly hope you weren't planning on reholstering that needle after tongue punching the zombie with it. A slightly wrong angle and say goodbye to your leg, well, your life, judging by the looks of this guy. Dakota administers the sleepy juice, knocking him out cold. No mercy kill yet though, unfortunately. Why don't we check back on Cherry to see how the big dramatic lifestyle change is going? Not great. She's getting picked up by her ex, Wish.com Colin Farrell named Ray. At a local diner, she was planning on shacking at for the night. Ray gives her a lift back to his place. On the way, they pass two people dragging something off the road. Maybe it's that late night roadside community service clearing off dangerous roadkill. That's a thing, right? Of course not, but that's what Ray thinks. Either way, I sure as shit would not be picking up any hitchhikers. This spurs a flirtatious conversation about the statistical significant rise of venison as a preferred cuisine within the last three years, correlating with a similar rise in animal vehicle collisions, inferring an approximate 60% of restaurants serving roadkill. Cherry removes her top. Ray continues, saying, quote, If you're driving out here at 70 miles an hour and a deer darts in front of you, if you blink, break, or swerve, sh you'll just kill yourself. Cherry, with lusting eyes and a fresh layer of hot red lipstick applied, asks, So what do you do? Ray answers, oh! <laughs> God. That's good. That, that, that is good. So yeah, his advice is generally sound if you follow it. Easier said than done though. Truthfully, it just depends. Are you in a 60s muscle car with a chicken crossing the road 40 feet in front of you? Plow. Are you in a Porsche 911 GT2 RS with a wrangle of deer 100 feet out on a straight road? Hit the brakes. Are you in a Pacifica and a little kid runs out after his red bouncy ball? Plow. I mean, uh, swerve. Apparently, it's a common misconception that you should speed up and amp up the kinetic energy of the collision. I gotta believe this originated in a bar down south by the same drunken redneck that imparted the sage technical engineering proverb, horsepower's how fast you hit the wall, pork's how far you take the wall with ya. Anyway, Mythbusters did an episode on speeding up to hit a moose. The results? The build team ran identical cars into a fake rubber moose at two different speeds. The damage from the high speed impact was located higher up on the vehicle and was more severe. It was speculated that hitting a moose at a high speed would only work with a very low car, such as an F1 race car. Such a car would be able to take out the legs and clear the area before the moose fell on top of it, ideally not getting decapitated by antlers, like that race car driver who hit a guy with a fire extinguisher. So the answer is basically no. Now, are you in a tow truck with your gal after just explaining you shouldn't swerve? Well, according to Ray, it wasn't a deer in the road. Bro, if it's a zombie, you speed up. Fortunately, Ray's packing serious heat, an AR-15 with an old school night vision scope mounted. He makes chase, interrupting the feeding frenzy with a few well-placed shots in one of them. Clearly zombies, also clearly unaffected by body shots from a 223. Luckily, these zombos scare easily and scurry off into the woods instead of bum-rushing Ray. From only a few feet out, with their relative immunity to small caliber rounds, they could easily take him and double their servings of meat. Ray clearly is above average for a pro tag, but I'd give him the benefit of the doubt in recognizing the need to make his next shots headshots. Despite doing everything Ray could be asked to do, Cherry got f***ed up. 
As bad as her wounds are, her leg getting chewed clean off and all, it could have been worse. It can always be worse. Remembering back to the good doctor's words, an infection of the limb can be dealt with with a hacksaw. A neck or chest wound, not so much. The first thought everyone would have here, including Ray, is amputation. Well, more amputation. In reality, Sherry's a zombie. Blood is pumping around your body in an average of three feet per second. If we also want to use WWZ logic here, freshly bitten people turn into full-on zombies in less than 12 seconds. For infected blood to move up from the femoral artery into your heart, you have about three to four seconds at best. Within four frames, Cherry's on a gurney in the hospital about to be treated by Dr. Block. Due to the strange explanation of Cherry's condition, the local PD hauls him off to the side for interrogation while every other patient walking by has the same horrible boils all over them. They take their questioning to the station where another officer busts in hollering about a perp that bit his finger clean off. Lucky that was all the perp did considering how fast those two zombies took Cherry's leg off. Sheriff Haig and Carlos take the pump to go deal with the perp. Carlos said he was handcuffed in the cruiser, but when they get outside, all they find is a busted back window. That is, until they look left. Then proceed to ignore the pupating monstrosity to hand Carlos back his wedding ring. Awful situational awareness and peripheral vision. Not to mention, just bizarre prioritization. How did all of you miss the crowd forming around you and zombies in dead sprints rushing in? If your heads were not firmly lodged in your ass, You'd have recognized the threat, retreated back into the station, locked and loaded with all those shotguns inside, and been able to successfully thin the herd before making a swift getaway in one of your police cars. Instead, Gollum's trying to get his precious amidst the rampage. <laughs> Serves him right. He's not dead from that? Okay, <laughs> Carlos is a tank. Now with the power of the ring, he slam fires a zombie with a succession of uppercuts. <laughs> Backup arrives to mop up the rest with overwhelming firepower. Sheriff Haig and Ray hop in his truck to go rescue Cherry. Wait, wait, is that the truck he double McTwist 1260'd at 60 miles an hour? How is it? Because it's, it's so open. much fun, get really? it? Never mind. Cherry finally wakes up after surgery. Considering the lack of her being a boil infested walking mutation, I'd say she's doing pretty good. All three of the newly arrived corpses are also doing pretty good. So good, they got up and walked right out of the hospital. Dr. Block and his assistant correctly assess that they have lost control and whatever's going on is spreading rapidly, too rapidly to treat or contain. They need to get the out. It's just too little too late. Block finds patient zero doing the bone sign. <laughs> Dr. Block doesn't seem like the type to get paralyzed by fear. He had ample time to duck and run. Absolutely nothing good was going to come from standing still in front of this walking pus sack. He only has one arm for sake. A simple shove at the saw-wielding arm and a swift kick push to the gut and you can bolt. I'm afraid that jam slather job sealed your fate. Block's wife ain't doing so hot either. I skipped over some couple drama earlier, but long story short, she cheated on him. He found out, stabbed her with her little friends, aka anesthetics, and locked her in a closet. Well, she broke out, aimed for the bushes, then tried to open the car door handle with her limp wrists. One question, how were you planning on turning the key in the ignition once you got inside. Oh, with your mouth. Well, if you're that good with your tongue, you should have tried opening the door with it. Who knows what she was injected with, but Novocaine wears off in about an hour. I say lay low in the dumpster until you actually have functioning hands that you can use to defend yourself, as well as drive without wrapping yourself around a tree. Somehow, they arrive safely at her parents' house. The plan? She's going to check it out while leaving her son in the car with a loaded gun. Goes about how you'd expect. Oopsies. You know, he'd have been relatively safe inside a locked car. If anyone needed the gun, it was you. Also, he's a dumb kid. Jesus. If you were so nervous about getting murdered by your ex-husband, maybe driving to a predictable destination, such as your parents' house, was a bad idea. Go somewhere that's not in his mental itinerary.
Getting out of your car for anything other than a gas station is dangerous with your numbed hands. You barely got the door unlocked the first time. Sure enough, Block ambushes her, telling her he's going to eat her brains. A clear sign, you should get back into your car, pry the revolver from your dead son's rigor mortis hands, pop Block, and drive away. Nope, Dakota opens the door to grab her son, leaving the gun in the car, and carries him to the door where she's lucky to be let in by her unzombified dad. Her dad easily could have been dead with the door locked, stranding her to a brainless fate. Well, more brainless. Sheriff Haig and Ray roll into the hospital deep with a truck bed full of armed cops. They proceed to form a tight perimeter, so tight they can apparently only send Ray into the infested hospital alone, armed with nothing but a pocket knife. Y'all must not like Cherry very much. Everyone's getting gutted hard. Everyone except Ray. Dude is an absolute animal. I take back my wish.com Colin Farrell comment. Bro even took a second to put on latex gloves before putting in that wet work. Expertly neo-dodging arterial spray too. Problem is, finding Cherry is gonna be like finding a needle in a haystack, given that she was most likely moved after surgery. And that's if she's not already a zombie. I mean, let's be honest. Her chances are pretty low with that stump. Her only real chance would be to hide it out, which is exactly what she did. I'd have tried crawling over to shut the door first. Any one of these crazies could have seen that blanket over the body as a meal. Ray, being the thoughtful and resourceful man that he is, rams a table leg into her recently amputated nub so she can walk herself out. I want to say using those IV stands as a cane would have sufficed, been less awkward to use, wouldn't have had a chance of simply falling off, and been less destructive to her healing wound. But who am I to argue with results? When they reach the Xville point, all the cops are gone. Ray seems to think that they all left for JT's. Optimistic. What makes you think they didn't all get chewed up and turned? These crazies have shown that they will pick up and use things as weapons. So the lack of firearms littered everywhere isn't really strong evidence. You'd think if they got swarmed and tactically withdrew to JT's, they would have taken the truck there. They had at least a half a dozen officers. So the only way to defensively transport everyone without clown carring would be the tow truck. The cops have shown a disdain for Ray, so there's no reason to think that they'd leave it for him, especially when the chances of his survival were extremely low. I wouldn't expect much of a reception at JT's. Considering it's still well within town, I'd opt to head somewhere far more remote instead. At JT's, everyone gets a badge and a gun, except for Ray. Again, what the f***? Man, Ray pulled off that harrowing rescue op by himself with some butterfly knives, successfully extracting the VIP with no injuries. That was an act of valor. And let's face it, you need all the trained shooters you can get. It's especially stupid when you let Carlos keep his revolver after panic shooting an uninfected man asking for help. I'd have given his gun to Ray. Then again, I don't know Ray's backstory. Inside, they find JT alive, having nuked the zombie's brains with his 12 gauge. JT shows them the goods, a built chopper and a chopped hot rod. They got themselves a real convoy. Now let's shove that meat into the trunk and hightail it out of here before more of those things show up. God knows if they found this place, others will too. You know how when you get into your car and go for a drive, you instinctively drive to places that you're familiar with? These zombies might not be all that different. They come out of some sort of instinct, a memory of the best barbecue in Texas. Well, everyone decides they need a good rest instead. No perimeter guards, nothing. A moment later, pure chaos. The restaurant's in flames with Haig critically wounded, shot in the neck by none other than Carlos. Jesus Christ, please take his guns away. More survivors show up. Seems this is the hottest place in town. Yet another reason I'd have gone somewhere else. Sheriff Haig, now realizing the severity of the situation, unshackles El Ray. Ray, now in command, orders everyone to grab a weapon and follow him to the trucks. They're gonna make a break for the Mexican border. Carlos, making the critical error of standing next to a window, gets simply mangled. <laughs> Not one second later, Ray Dome shots all of them in succession. Guess that's why y'alls want to be nice to the best gunfighter in the room. I bet if that was Cherry, she wouldn't have had a scratch on her. The survivors mount such an effective firing line that the brainless zombies literally tuck tail and gimp away as fast as they can. For a moment, things are looking good. Until they turn around and see the horde of rotten souls surrounding their getaway vehicles. Ray hatches another plan. The woman with the table leg is going to sprint over to his tow truck while he snipes all the nearby zombies. Uh, why doesn't Ray go himself? He's fast as f***, knows parkour, can quick draw like Buster Scruggs, and it's his truck. 
I do get that the entire team can't run outside and mow through them together. They're trying to conserve their limited ammo. Then she's going to drive it back so they can load up the survivors while Table Leg commandeers the motorcycle. The one vehicle that requires both legs to work the shifter and brakes. Yeah, yeah, she could ride the front brakes with her hands, but with how insane these zombies are, you're gonna want all the braking maneuvering capabilities you can get. It just makes no sense to not put her in the hot rod or tow truck. Y'all have way too much confidence and Ray's hasty implant job. All seats are taken, so Ray, the team's most valuable marksman, gets allocated Dakota's dead son's mini bike. Jesus, Dakota is an irresponsible parent. It's the highway to hell. It's relatively smooth sailing until they reach the bridge out of town. The Zombozos have created a meat wall, or at least tried to. Realistically, Ray and Sherry should pull to the shoulders and let the tow truck plow a path through like Moses. No way Three Rows is gonna stop a 9,000 pound tow truck going 50. It's a good thing they didn't, because sitting right behind those zombies are two military trucks filled with armed soldiers, Muldoon's men. Seems they know El Ray pretty well. I have a feeling they're not gonna be whisked off their feet and take it to a beach in Mexico. Nope, they all wake up in a prison cell inside a military base. Same one Abby was so kindly held up at. He debriefs them. DC-2 is known infamously as Project Terror. These soldiers were stealing biochemical weapons that were designed to take out an entire populace in a controlled landlocked area. You know, islands that you could much more safely nuke. The only treatment is a regimented exposure therapy to DC-2 itself. But once exposed, they need a continuous supply or else they turn ravenous. Oh, I see where Abby's going with this. Got that subscription payment plan for life. Surprise, surprise. Scientist Abby is also supposedly working on an antidote. A cute fairy tale he's telling everyone to make himself indisposable for the time being. I'm with El Ray. Put their backs against the ocean and fight it out. Then when worse comes to worse, set sail for a remote island and live that fishing life while the supply runs out for Muldoon and rot withers them away. It's the Dawn of the Dead plan, except this time it will work because it's not the dead universally rising from being full or whatever that quote was. The soldiers arrive, taking Cherry and Dakota out of the cell for thorough examination and questioning. Wink, wink. By none other than Quentin Tarantino, or as he's known on IMDb, Number one. While she's taking an elevator down to Quentin's dungeon, Ray, JT, and the dude with the saxophone make a hasty maneuver on the guards. And that, folks, is why you don't put your guards in the locked cell with the prisoners. You don't need to. That's what the cell's for. Guess nobody said the DC-2 makes you smart. Apparently, Ray trusts Abby, the rogue scientist who created this nightmare fuel and was orchestrating deals with Muldoon, enough to toss him his pistol. The enemy of your enemy is your friend until they strike a new deal. Abby clearly has no morals or allegiances. I mean, the man collects testicles. If Ray knew Abby, he should know that. They do make a great team Team, though, dispatching the guards like a splinter cell co-op run. With the gas running out, Muldoon exposits his rationale for trying to buy himself some DC-2. Something something, he was on a raid in Afghanistan where he killed Bin Laden, but was somehow exposed to DC-2. So he came back to the States looking to get a hold of more DC-2 from Abby to delay their transformations into abominations. There's as many holes in his story as in Bin Laden's body. Ultimately, Ray shouldn't give a sh Muldoon gets one in the head, then Abby gets departed quickly after. After all, Abby is the one who created Project Terror, then kicked shit off by initiating the back alley deal, and then shooting the canisters which released DC-2 all over town. That's what Muldoon should have started with, and attempted to pit Ray against Abby. Want more incentive? Once Muldoon is dealt with and they get out of prison, Abby has every reason to eliminate any loose ends with knowledge about his involvement. I mean, the guy keeps a bag of testicles, he chops off his victims. Safe to say, he's a psycho that can't be trusted. I never had a choice. That's it? Huh, I was expecting more of a fight from Bruce Willis. Downstairs in this dungeon, Cherry quickly turns Quentin's to a murder by pouring him with her stick leg, then stomping it through his eye socket. Oh, he's not dead? And he's still in the mood for some loving. He is having some DC-2 ED problems downstairs though. Not that that's stopping him. Wow, this is human centipede levels of disgusting. Before his guard buddy can back him up, Dakota comes in clutch with a ballistic syringe. <laughs> 
Okay, that's a thing. Sure. I don't know how I didn't think of that. It gets better. Ray arrives replacing her broken leg with a machine gun. Cool. Ray's plan, load up, get to the choppers. You know, I do like simple plans. Easy to follow, hard to screw up. None of that mission impossible sh Looks like JT and Haig aren't gonna make it after all. That's why Ray so thoughtfully left the detonators with him, giving them instructions to blow in three minutes. But why? Why not keep the detonators and blow in your clear? What if any number of things occurred delaying your escape? like enemy soldiers pinning you down. Or if you had to hit the head real quick. What if JT and Hank both lose consciousness for blood loss before the three minute mark? And what do you know? They get pinned down by the soldiers before they can reach the choppers. Abby heroically advances under fire. Well, that's not good, because your three minutes are up. Cherry, Ray, and the rest of the survivors rush the helicopters, miraculously not sustaining a single casualty, despite the overwhelming weapons and training disparity. Ooh, looks like I spoke too soon. Ray gets lit up by a zombie. Crazy, considering he had the drop on the soldier. It really sucks, because he was the only real helicopter pilot here, beside the strip club owner, of course. <laughs> Ray passes, and Cherry gets lifted out. Start a new life, leading a band of survivors in the Aztec ruins of Mexico. The movie ends with Cherry riding into the sunset with her daughter. With the sheer suspension of reality that our protagonists can conjure up, alongside our tactical prowess, Ray and Cherry would have lived happily ever after in Mexico with their child, while the rest of the survivors perished horrific, lonely fates. For that reason, I think Grindhouse Planet Terror was beaten. Moral of the story, save yourself.